Let's open our Bibles this morning to Nehemiah chapter 13, verse 1. We'd mentioned to you that the last half of this book is really the longest report that we have in the Bible of a true revival. And everything that you learn there is is applicable, I think, to our own personal lives as well. How do we stay close and on fire and and productive in the Lord after years of of walking with him? And so we've gotten a lot to, to look at. In fact, Nehemiah had come to Jerusalem in the 20th year of Artaxerxes, according to chapter two, he would go back to Persia in the 32nd year of Artaxerxes, according here to in verse six. So he had been there for 12 years as the governor, as the builder, as the leader, and then he went back. We don't know how long he was gone. We do know it was long enough for people to get married and have children, and unfortunately long enough for this revival that is so clearly kind of delineated here to go away. The, the, the turning away from the Lord. It is almost a proverbial, while the, my, uh, you know, the cat's away, the mice will play. The leadership of Nehemiah had a lot to do with the spiritual health of the people. If, if anything, this chapter throws the reality back into the equation. Because without good spiritual ongoing leadership, your revival, your walk with God, can certainly diminish, diminish greatly and fairly quickly. There's something about us that tends towards entropy, you know, the, the path of least resistance, to go downhill is far easier than going uphill, to, to, to just not go to church is easier than going, to not read my Bible is far easier than reading, to be angry is far easier than forgiving. And so it is easy to just kind of fall, and they did fall. And it is a chapter that, at least beginning in verse four, Nehemiah looks back to show us what had happened while he was gone, and what he did when he returned. But the first three verses are really the the transitional verses, and we'll we'll go to verse 14 this morning, and then we'll try to take the rest of the book and finish it out next Sunday. But here's three verses that are the end of the revival. In fact, we read in verse one, on that day they read from the book of Moses, in the hearing of all the people it was found, written that no Ammonite or Moab should ever come into the assembly of God because they had not met the children of Israel with bread and water, but had hired Balaam against them to curse them. Therefore our God turned the curse into a blessing. And so it was when they had heard the law that they separated all of the mixed multitude from Israel. And that is the end of the report, if you will, of the revival. Notice that Nehemiah left with that ringing in his ears that there was a significant dedication and it was a sustained and kind of glorious revival that kind of came on the backs of the determination of the hearts of the people to to walk with God. It it is, by the way, always this formula that you read here in the first three verses. Fairly simple to follow. Read the Bible for yourself. Obey what God says to you. And then you'll be in a good position to help others. But, But be selfish first. Take care of you. Make sure that you do well and that you obey. Beginning in verse 4, however, we read the words, Now before this, Nehemiah looks back to the years or the months, if not probably years, that he was gone, and how that the revival had come to a kind of an abrupt end. The people retreated from walking with God. They lost their devotion and commitment to the Lord. They were lukewarm at best and openly defiant at worst. They just decided God's ways weren't good enough and weren't necessary for them. So if you want a lesson for the book as, as, or, or the chapter as a whole, certainly there is a tremendous need in our life for spiritual diligence. We're going to have to stick with it if we're going to go anywhere. Because look, the enemy doesn't want you to do well. And though you go to sleep at night, he never sleeps. He is 24-7 out to do that which he likes to do more than anything else, keep you from the good and from the blessings of God. So if you want to know what to do to backslide, here's my advice. Do nothing. You don't really have to do anything to fall. But to maintain your walk with God, you're going to do, do, do quite a bit of stuff. You're going to have to commit yourself 
to the things of God because the enemy would like to take away from you the things that keep you going, to keep you from putting into practice what you know that you should. As a pastor, these chapters especially, and there's plenty of them in the Bible, encourage me that there are inevitably setbacks in pastoring people. They do well for a while, and then sometimes they absolutely do poorly. And you can take it personal, or you can just say, you know, this is the battle that we face. This is the, the difficulty that we face. And because of that, as pastors, you have this built-in kind of ongoing message that you have to continue to preach. Go to church. Get to church. Make yourself accountable. Get your Bible out. Read it. And it almost sounds like a broken record sometimes. But it's the, it's the way of life. It's the, it's the life-giving that God has given to us as his people. We need fellowship. We need the, 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 the wisdom of God's word. We need to reinforce our relationships with others in the Lord because the, the enemy wants to take away the essentials. And if he can get you away from those things, you're not going to grow. You're going to die on the vine. Well, I go to heaven? Oh, probably dead. You'll go to heaven dead. I mean, spiritually so. You're just, here I am, Lord. I made it just barely, but I made it. So Nehemiah, he leaves after 12 years with verses 1, 2, and 3. And, and the five or six chapters that have gone before, they were doing well and it had been going on for quite some time. But then we read this. Now before this, Eliashib, the priest, having authority over the stored houses of the house of our God, had allied with Tobiah. He had prepared for him a large room which previously had stored the grain offerings and the frankincense, the articles and the tithes of grain, the new wine and the oil which were commanded to be given to the priests, uh, to the Levites, the singers, the gatekeepers, and the offerings for the priests. But during all of this time, I wasn't in Jerusalem. In the 32nd year of uh, Artaxerxes, the king of Babylon, I had returned to the king. And then after certain days, I obtained leave from the king. Nehemiah remembered the commitments he had seen, but then began to tell us what happened when he got back the decline that he saw, the, the shock that he was faced with when he had left this vibrant, godly, thriving people behind. And he struggled with what he found. It is sometimes hard, I think, to be a voice for God, especially if you have to say, as Nehemiah does to these folks, to the leaders, to the high priests, man, what you're doing isn't good. This isn't, this isn't the, the way of life. This isn't a good way to make lots of friends. I suspect that in so doing, Nehemiah made plenty more enemies. But he was willing to be the hammer in the hand of God if it would benefit the people and bring honor to the Lord. Eliashib was the high priest at this time. He held a position of spiritual leadership. He should have been one who set the spiritual tone for the people. But he disqualified himself because of his relationship and friendship with the world. Turned his head, neglected the things of God to his own detriment, to the spiritual detriment of the people. He made, he made his decisions, we read, based on favoritism and family over godly service. His allegiance to those in his family clouded his service altogether. Tobiah, you probably have remembered if you've been with us, was an Ammonite who was an avowed enemy of God. He was around since the beginning of the book. Before Nehemiah had ever gotten to Jerusalem, we read of him in verse 10 of chapter 2 that he was grieved that, that anyone would ever come to help the Jews. Nine verses later in chapter 2 verse 19, he joins a couple of others to begin to mock the, uh, the idea or the thought that they could come and make a difference that they had come to make a difference in serving the Lord. In chapter 4, he had been the guy, along with others, now many others, who began to threaten violence if the work wasn't stopped immediately. In chapter 6, it was he who wrote letters time and again threatening murder and, and slaughter and, and suffering if they didn't stop. And then he changed his course completely. He sent a letter asking for lunch, wanting to be a friend, all to no avail because Nehemiah was in touch with God and this underhanded kind of messenger of the devil, uh, Tobiah, had never been a good guy. He, he was always on the other side of the, of the work of God. Eliashib, though, had uh, the high priest allied himself with Tobiah through marriage. 
Both Tobiah and his son married Jewish women, chapter 6. But the effect was that the enemy now had a strong alliance within the walls. And this fellow, Tobiah, was a phony. His name means God is good. <laughs> he didn't live up to his name at all. Now, Nehemiah had never so much as let this guy into the, uh, into the building, into the property, into the city. You can read there in chapter 2 about, you know, he knew of his affiliation in chapter 6, but he had kept him out. He, you're not going to be a part of all that God is doing here. And when he had left the chief priest himself, the senior pastor, if you will, the guy who made the decisions through partiality instead of godly wisdom, let this God-hating uh, person into, not the city, but right onto the temple grounds, the place where many people couldn't go, only the priest. It is a dangerous thing when spiritual leaders ignore the wisdom of God and begin to show partiality to their family or to their friends and somehow dismissing the sins of those people that they like or that are close to them and without discernment or without standard, they promote them in the life of the church when they really shouldn't be where they have, have, have found themselves. You know, overseers that don't care for the spiritual well-being of those under them they use their position for self-interest. And that's certainly the case of this high priest. You might be in charge of the worship and you say of someone, man, they can sing. And we need another really good singer. And you say, yeah, but they're not saved. And you say, well, but they'll come to church eventually. And they're my cousin. And I'd really like them to come. And we bend the rules for the sake of the family rather than a, you know, believing that God's ways bring life. And that's what you find here. The qualifications that the Bible set forth were ignored for the sense of friendship. So they cut them some slack. They give them another chance. If you knew him like I knew, he's a real good person down deep inside. Now this guy was a rat. Verse 5 tells us that Elijah gave to Tobiah as a living quarter, one of the storage chambers that had previously been used to store the gifts that the people were bringing to take care of the priests, the worship leaders, the gatekeepers. In fact, just go back to verse 44 of the last chapter. There are one, two, three, four verses that speak specifically about how the people in the midst of revival wanted to be sure that there was plenty of resources to be sure that these priests stayed open full time, that there was a, a service to be had and, and that the peace, uh, pre, uh, priests would be available to the people. But now that had changed. And we find uh, Tobiah living in a storage unit ones that should have held the offering so that the people could be paid, but it was now vacated through the poor leadership of this high priest. The giving had slowed. No one trusted him. And as a result, verse 10, the priests couldn't stay at their job anymore. They had to go take care of their families. They went back to farming rather than taking care of God's people. Eliashib, the high priest, was renting out rooms in the temple just to make ends meet. And the reason, pretty simple, God's blessing dried up <laughs> because no one was walking with God. Revival is only maintained as we walk with God. And the minute we stop, the minute you stop, the minute you stop going to church, getting your Bible out, making yourself accountable, it, it is a quick trip downward because that's how we're made. Sin does that. The world does that. You got to be on your guard. The precious things of God can quickly be crowded out here, as they are here with the deceptive things of the world. And the fruit of God's presence was no longer evident. Now they had an empty shell, an empty room. Once, once it was bustling, it was blessed. The people were alive. Now it is filled, notice, with the enemy's presence. Here's the threat to your spiritual life. Satan would like to introduce you to Tobiah. It takes a lot of forms. But he'd like to have him live at your house, to take some of your time, some of your resources, some of your energy, to move into your family, to, 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 to divide and to destroy, to steal you away. Where, where God was once worshipped, he would now like to live. And if, if he can get in, there'll be three cheers from hell at the victory that has been made over you. Look, look these are the very sins that brought captivity to begin with. This is what had happened 
years earlier when they had been carried away. In fact, if you go back to chapter 9, I think it is, the first couple of verses, they had said out loud to Nehemiah and to the Lord, we're going we're gonna to confess our sins. We, we realize where we've gone wrong. We want to do things right from here on out. Why is it that people that are so excited for the Lord at one moment seem to completely turn away from him the next? Part of the problem is what is mentioned in verse 3. That there is this mixed multitude that is always found amongst those who love the Lord. Notice the words before this. <laughs> that was the influence. The mixed multitudes you will find in your Bible beginning in the book of Exodus as the Jews are brought out of Egypt, and with them come a lot of folks who didn't like Egypt. Oh, they didn't love the Lord, but they wanted out. And if the Jews are leaving, we're leaving. And you find them stuck in the middle of God's people. But here's the interesting thing. In every case where they are mentioned from there out forward in the Bible, they are always on the leading edge of trouble. They're the complainers first, they're the grumblers first, they stir up trouble first, they turn from God, they lead others astray, they have terrible influence. And I would go so far as to say this, every church has a mixed multitude among the congregation. In every church. In attendance, when they want to be, not really sold out to the Lord, they are usually the ones on the forefront of finding fault, pointing fingers, stirring up contention. They are detrimental to the health of the church. They have always been and they will always be. Their love for Jesus is conditional. It's based upon ease and agreement. And when things get rough, they usually get going. They're, they're charismatic folks, at least in the Bible. They are personable. They have great influence, but they're not doing anything for good. So here comes Nehemiah. And he returns after however long he's been gone. And he finds that he, he runs into the fruit of a people that have decided that God's ways are no longer important. But he doesn't cater to the, man, to the demands of the louder mixed multitude. He goes after the hearts of those who are hungry for the Lord. He wants to help them. When the mixed multitude leave, that's a blessing to any church. It is called blessed subtraction. And though you want God to add to the body, sometimes it's good when God does a couple of different mathematical moves. He takes them out. And as such here, you do the math, <laughs> it can only help those who want to walk with God. So Nehemiah returns, and verse 7, he comes to Jerusalem and he discovered the evil that the high priest had done with his fellow Tobiah in present, uh, preparing him a room for him in the courts of the house of God. It grieved me bitterly, and therefore I threw all of the household goods of Nehemiah out of the room. You go, Nehemiah. I like his style. In fact, in chapter 13, a little bit later next week, he's going to just grab some guys by the hair and throw them around. I don't know if that's proper, but it seems like it would work to me. It's appealing anyway. So he comes back, he sees what's going on, he gets wind of it, and being the, the good and, and, and true spiritual leader that he is, Nehemiah was both angry and very disappointed. His heart was broken, that's exactly what it means. He had, he had left things in good order, he had found that things had now fallen apart. His anger wasn't about him, it had everything to do with what the, the honor of the Lord. This is not good what's going on. And so he acts accordingly. It's a disappointment when you see people that you hope would do well do poorly. Paul certainly had that experience with Demas. Demas was a guy that, that he served with for years. He, he, he was with him in Colossae and, and mentioned in the letter that he wrote. He is with him in uh, the, the Philemon letter as well. And, and Paul was a guy that depended upon Demas a lot until you get to the very last book that Paul writes. And he's able to say to Timothy with, with heartbrokenness, Demas is left. He's loved this present world more than the Lord. He's gone. He's gone back to the world. And it broke Paul's heart. Paul would continue. But not everyone that was on board with him would. So here comes Nehemiah. Godly man. And he's having to make some pretty tough choices that are not going to bless him outwardly. He's going to make some enemies. 
but who are, it's going to bless the people. And it's going to bring back the blessings of God. So he starts in verse 8 by spring cleaning. He takes all of his junk and he throws it at the curb. It's a drastic action, I'll give you that. But I like Nehemiah. Second of all, verse 9, he commanded that, the, that they clean the rooms and that you then restore them back to its use. The articles of God and the grain offerings and the frankincense should be moved back in. So he doesn't just, you know, 86 the guy, he fumigates the place. Right? Let's give this back to the Lord. And let's make sure that this is again used for the eternal purposes for which they've been created. Let's get back to doing, to doing things God's way. Let's put the Lord first in these things. And like I said, I'm sure his, his actions made him some quick enemies, but in time it would bring the blessings of God. It, it should be noted, and, and maybe you have picked up on it as well, that Nehemiah surrounded himself with men who love the Lord. In other words, he, his, his spirituality was sustained in many ways because of the fellowships that he kept. And I think there's something to be said for that. Look at Eliashib and who he's hanging around with and what the fruit of that was. Paul would say to the Ephesians in chapter 5, I think it's verse 11, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. Rather, just expose them. He said to the Romans in chapter 1, I can't wait to see you that I might be comforted in you as well by our mutual faith. He wrote at the end of the book of Romans in chapter 16, mark those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrines that I've taught you. Avoid them. He wrote to the Corinthians, don't keep fellowship or company with immoral, sexually immoral people. He wrote to the Thessalonians in chapter 3. We read it this morning. That you should withdraw yourself from every brother walking disorderly, not according to the traditions that you have received from us. He would write in that same chapter, if anyone will not obey the words of the epistle, then don't have any company with them. So they, they might be ashamed. The, 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 the book is filled with, you know, be careful who you surround yourself with. Pick your friends carefully because they're going to have a lot to do with your spiritual well-being. And you might ask yourself, are the people that I call and hang out with and go to dinner with, are they helping me spiritually or are they just covering my compromise? Do I find people that this will let me be however I want because I want to be that way and so I don't want someone going, let's pray every time we eat? i got to have some guys out around me that are acting like I am. Who really would want to be this guy, Eliashev? He plays the spiritual leader in the front room while he plays the devil in the back room. Accommodating the flesh, crowding out the things of God. One room at a time, a two-faced phony. And God's man, Nehemiah, just wouldn't stand for it. Verse 10, I also realized that the portions for the Levites had not been given them. For all of the Levites and the singers who did the work had now gone back to his field. So I contended with the rulers. I said, why is the house of God forsaken? I gathered them together. I set them in their place. I'll bet he did. And I told Judah to bring the tithes of the grain and the new wine and all into the storehouse. And I appointed a treasure over that storehouse. There's his name. <laughs> and some others. They were considered, end of verse 13, faithful. Their job was to distribute to their brethren. So Nehemiah, having you know, cleaned the room and reestablished it for the use of God, now finds out that the reason the servants at the temple aren't there is they can't afford to be there. There's no more support for them. Nobody cares. There's no value placed upon their service. And what had happened at the end of chapter 12 was no longer happening at the beginning here of chapter 13. Now there was an enemy in the camp. The offerings were down. The spiritual well-being of the people had slipped. People were quitting. They couldn't be trusted. There was a crooked guy in charge. No wonder everyone's running for the hills. You should never put into authority someone who has brilliant qualifications in every way except their spiritual life. Just ask Eli, who put his sons there in second, when well, it was first Samuel, I guess, chapter two put them in charge, and they just absolutely drove everyone away from the worship of God. So here the Levites, who had been 
applauded and, and used and encouraged back in chapter 12 and 11 and 10 are now farming to feed their families while the heart of God and in the hearts of the people have grown cold because of compromise and poor leadership. Earlier the people had repented. <laughs> they had acknowledged, we want the Lord to do things in our lives. We're gonna support the temple and all that it stands for. But look at them now. I don't know if you've ever been to Europe, but there are more cathedrals on city tours in Europe that are empty than in any place in the world. Go to downtown London, go to the Duomo in, in Milan. Beautiful place, cost millions of dollars, took years to build, was once filled with worship. Absolutely empty. In fact, most Western European cities what were established were established with a church in the middle. So no matter where you go, every road led to the church. Go to Venice, every road will lead to the Duomo. Every sign will say, that's where it is. And when you get to the church, you're in the center of town. But they're empty. They're just building. Because now, whatever had happened before is no longer happening there. And that was the case here as Nehemiah returned. So he, his job is to put things back in order. It is a tough call. It is tough responsibility. And so he, he, he fumigates the place and he evicts a guy who doesn't belong there. And he, he meets with the, with the rulers and gets in their face, sets things in order. What are you doing letting God's house go forsaken? What is, what is going on here, you leaders? He contended with them. He was on a tear, wasn't he? He retrieved the people. He retrieved the priests. He brought back the folks to serve. He kept screaming out, we're putting God first. We're putting him first. He puts them back in service, 12 and 13 here. And, and, and the offerings begin to return as people realize there's a faithfulness in leadership. There's a man who's been there who is faithful, as we read, men there, faithful in their task. People are getting cared for again. And the fruit begins to grow. And the spiritual life begins to grow. And then Nehemiah says this. And he writes it in several places. And we'll read it again before we get to the end of the book. Uh, towards the end of this book. I think the last verse. He says this to the Lord. Remember me, God, concerning this. Don't wipe out my good deeds that I have done for the house of my God and for its services. I think because very few people seem to appreciate his strong leadership, he, he kept going back to the Lord. And he says it several times. You remember, Lord. And may the good works and the sacrifices and the, and the confrontation and the difficulty uh, eventuate themselves into a life that will continue, that this won't just come and go like I've seen it come and go since I've returned. To Nehemiah, the cost of this leadership was, was great, but God would use it to bless. It wasn't a prayer for personal reward. He was just asking God to bless the radical changes at all costs so that they wouldn't just fall along the wayside. Pretty good warnings in there about where we're at because literally you need daily devotion if you're gonna do well. And, and the danger is as good as chapter seven and eight and nine and 10, 11 and 12 were, chapter 13 is horrible. And it happened just a few years later. Everyone on fire, everyone fires out. And one guy who just will not take no for an answer. Verse 25 next week, he's the hair, hair pulling Nehemiah. He got physical. This is not politically correct. Yeah, I went to church, got beat up by the pastor, apparently not happy at all with what I'm doing. Like I'm saying, you can't do it today, but you can, you can enjoy it, reading it. And sometimes maybe that'll help, I don't know. My dad pulled me by the hair, it helped me plenty. So read ahead for next week and we'll conclude the study then. Father, thank you this morning as we sit together for your faithfulness to us. And Lord, how blessed we are as we sit together realizing that you have for us far better than the enemy, but yet we should be on notice that our spiritual well-being is constantly under attack. We have an enemy that will not sleep, that his goal is destruction. He hates God and he hates his people. And if we're not on, on guard the work can certainly begin to fall apart and the good things of God in our life can fall by the wayside that we need to stick with the essentials. Not presume that all, everything will just stay good. No, it won't. We need to stay in your word and stay in the fellowship. Plug ourselves in. Make ourselves accountable. The enemy doesn't want to... He wants to isolate us from the group. 
surround us with a bunch of mixed multitude folks whose, whose entire life is consumed with complaining and griping and division and self-service, all the while acting the spiritual part. Father, would you surround us with godly men and women that would help us to grow? May we decide, not based on family favoritism or friendships, what your word says, but may we equally apply it because we are sure that your ways work and your ways bring life. And though it is hard to stand sometimes, when those around us who love us want us to bend, may we not bend and may we not ignore your word for anyone or for anything. We realize, Lord, that when you're set aside, the enemy has plenty of room to move in one room at a time and take over. Keep us, Father, from that. Keep us close to you. Surround us with godly men and women. Watch over us and give us not only good pastors, but give us the heart of Nehemiah that, that for your glory's sake, we will make great sacrifices and make great commitments because we want to see your blessing at work in our lives. If something is keeping you from the Lord today, if your relationships, your attitude, your involvement, or the lack thereof, understand this, the fall is easy, but so is the retrieval. You go back to doing what you know. You do it now, you do it faithfully. You do it constantly. And as you do, you'll not be subject to the enemy's lies, Tobiah won't be living in your house. He'll find no place to rest. But if you've given him place, look, you can't repent slowly. <laughs> you just got to go, Lord, I don't want to do this anymore. And here it is. Change me. And this morning you can turn from that which you've been doing to that's what you should be doing. And healing can come and deliverance in a moment as you make the turn back to the Lord. Do that today. Come pray with one of the guys and, and make your commitment sure. And let's see what the Lord will do with you in 2018 as revival returns to your house and to your life. Shall we stand?